welcome. I'm hoping this promises to be um, one of the most important sessions and the most interactive session given how this has been planned. Uh, just a little bit uh, to set uh, to set the ball uh, rolling. Um, we've all heard uh, gender equality, gender equity, gender mainstreaming, gender integration, what it means, etc. These terms being uh, used um, in many, many forums, conversations that I'm assuming this audience would be privy to. But we are kind of at a point where uh, we're here with a few uh, women who have had their own journeys of uh, getting influenced and, and the opportunity to influence many, many minds through their professional and personal lives. And they have, in, uh, I'm including myself there, we have all uh, in some shape or form uh, kind of tried to break the glass ceiling. And uh, maybe it's not broken just yet, but uh, we have tried to do that. And what I'm hoping that we get out of this session today as we go through um, the conversations across the table with each of us uh, to understand what each of us have done in our lives to maybe take a step forward on the gender integration work. Um, and I'm sure personally and professionally, each of us have been uh, affected in different ways. If fighting is a word that I'd not use, but we've had to fight certain battles. Uh, uh, on both fronts. Um, and I'm hoping that with Anira, Megha, Neelam and myself, uh, we can all talk through a little bit about those small steps, those bigger leapfrogged uh, transformative interventions on both sides uh, that uh, have got us where we are today. Uh, I'm sure there's a huge room for all of us to cover personally, but also uh, what we can contribute as uh, women leaders uh, in the sector. Uh, before I hand it over to my fellow panelists, uh, let me introduce myself. I am Sakshi Gudwani. I am um, a senior program officer with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And uh, even though I work for their sanitation program, I'm hoping and I aspire to be a gender champion uh, in the world and try to make some kind of impact for us to uh, get women uh, at least equal opportunities, if not more, uh, in the world. So with that, let me hand it to uh, Neera to introduce herself first. Great. Thanks, Sakshi. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Neera. I'm one of the founders of Vestra, and I'm really looking forward to this panel. I must admit, I am most excited that this is happening between Neelam Mega and Sakshi. So I hope you all enjoy and you engage. It's an, an, an important topic that I feel it's been quite late in my life that I've leaned in to lend voice uh, to this. So I think there's a collective responsibility we all have. So thank you for attending. This is the first step. I will tag Mega. Okay. Hey, everyone. Are you able to hear me all right? Great. Okay, I'm delighted to be here. This is such a wonderful panel to uh, to share the next hour with, and I I'm very um, you know passionate as well as uh, excited to learn more about this topic. Uh, passionate because uh, I have experienced it firsthand, uh, and excited to learn because um, I have probably scratched the surface, uh, if at all, on it. And I look forward to sharing, but actually more importantly, hearing the stories of my fellow panelists as well as questions that come up because. We learn a lot from, from the questions uh, and understand, uh, understand uh, angles and perspectives that we, we, don't, uh, we, we often miss out. I'm a partner at Bain India. I have been at Bain now 15 years. And uh, aside from my client responsibilities, I uh, lead a lot of gender internal as well as now external initiatives, uh, purely out of personal passion, but with a lot of support uh, from my organization, which at any point I'm hugely dependent and very grateful for. Um, so I look forward to this. And let me tag uh, Neelam. Did we lose Neelam? Um, maybe. Okay. 
Yeah, I think she's frozen. Should we speak for Neelam or that wouldn't be very gender intentional? <laughs> <laughs> I think she's dropped off. So should we keep going? And she'll yeah, come back on? Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Um, should I start? Great. So let me read out what we, uh, it is a very interesting topic uh, over here, which I just had a quick glimpse of. Most studies say that women need to be more assertive and ask for more in order to rise up. I think we've all experienced that. Although there's great deal of public interest in ensuring more women become leaders, um, thereby reversing, uh, reversing the trend that we've all seen of underrepresentation. However, too many uh, suggested solutions, both uh, academic as well as uh, based out of organizational research are founded on, a, on what I believe is a misconception that women ought to emulate men. So let me start by sharing my own perspectives over here. And I'll also talk a little bit about what I think is gender intentionality in this context. So the fundamental belief uh, for any, from an organizational perspective of, um, of looking for greater representation, underlying the, the quest for greater representation of women is a strong underlying belief that there is merit. There is merit, not just at a societal, at an individual level, but at an organizational level of infusing and on a sustained basis, uh, a diversity of thought, a diversity of experiences in how organizations and its day-to-day -day, um, day -day, uh, interactions are run. Now, when we look at that as the goal and not as you know, uh, women's representation on, the, on just the surface of it, we realize that getting that diversity in, getting that diversity of thought and of experiences is actually just not possible if we don't bring in the perspective um, and don't account for the styles, the, the thought processes of about 50% of the population. Now yet, what we see very often is there is a belief, there is a recognition of the benefits of having greater representation. What we all often struggle with is, is yet, yet the styles, the, you know, the, the, the styles that are upheld um, and by, you know, in, in great part by some of us are often uh, seen to be um, more common amongst men. In my own experience, the reason for that is, is just, is just math, right? The systems that are in play today, the perspectives that are in play today have been designed in a setup, which for whatever contextual reason was largely comprised of a homogenous group, was largely comprised of men. A lot of organizations today work on feedback. Um, our sales are driven by customers. And guess what those populations look like? Those populations are also today and have historically been largely, have been more men than women. And as a result of that, that comes in the way of even great intentions and great belief in the merit of having more women represented. In my own experience, I've been very fortunate um, that many years back, I was uh, asked by a, a mentor, I was actually told by a mentor who currently also heads Bain India uh, in, a, in, a, in a very casual lunch that, look, I see you as a partner. That was the first time anybody, that was the first time I thought of myself as someone who would actually could, could, could even envision rising to leadership. Not because I didn't think I was capable of it, but mostly I just didn't see myself there. But I realized someone saw me there. And I realized that through that journey, a lot of people who spoke to me encouraged me, pointed out, even as I was talking about development and how I can be better, they encouraged me to focus and build upon strengths that were unique to myself. They resisted, I think they resisted the temptation to point me towards characteristics which they recognized may not be authentic for me, um, in, some, in some senses due to my gender, but perhaps for other reasons as well. Um, and I believe that, you know, I was, uh, my own experience was, was more positive than not in terms of having been allowed to, to build my own style, to celebrate my own style. To be clear, there were day-to-day -day nuisances, right? That, and there still are day-to-day -day nuisances where you are in conversations where, you know, the loudest voice, which is often not the woman's voice wins. Or, you know, there are situations where success in that particular situation requires uh, me to, requires behaviors or actions which are not in harmony with some personal choices I've made. And some of those personal choices are very much emanating from the fact that I'm a woman. So, you know, to me, the, uh, from an organizational perspective, I do believe this is a misconception. It's really hard to break. 
and it's and how to break it is actually what we're talking about in this session which is through gender intentionality which is really to me three things one truly having a true belief in the merit of uh, of gender of better gender representation the second is uh, recognizing that the systems today a lot of organizational processes systems are not designed for gender equity they are designed for contextual reasons but for an for a population that looks very different than the population that we're speaking out uh, speaking about today and then third acting with conviction right and when i say acting with conviction i don't want to call out that there are everyday dilemmas in the organization today which around gender int intentionality which is what is true for the larger part of the population of the women's population is that true for every woman are we are are we talking about equality or ident or or the fact that women may be equal but not identical and sometimes not getting bogged down in those details is also very very important in following through on gender intentionality so that's my perspective neera i'd love to hear yours especially as how you see it and you know when we and if and if you do see this what are the kind of characteristics or behaviors that you believe um are you know tend to be harder and tend to be more common as expectations from women but are not necessarily authentic to women yeah thanks thanks megan and i guess if i were to you know relook at that uh statement that you know you posted up up ahead there were a couple of highlights right do we need to be more assertive how do women you know take on more leadership role and should we be sort of emulating men i think that perhaps it's worth declaring that a lot of the perspective I want to share is isn't isn't a broad perspective, right? And and there's a lot of things that play into uh, gender, and it's not just about gender. It's also the intersectionality of of class, of uh, caste, of economic status. And so, I suppose my perspective comes very much with it. It, it perhaps is narrow, but it might be a little bit. Uh, worthwhile to call out, mainly because my life has been quite a lot about fighting this and being part of not fighting actually being part of a, a dominant uh, gender in which case has been male right so I studied math I grew up with a bunch of engineers women engineers who all said. <clears throat> you know it's about being in these male dominated professions and environment that is success. So I think a lot of our parents and what we are exposed to in our early days, you cannot underestimate how much that shape shapes us. So that led to, you know, my studying math and going into investment banking, working in, at Morgan Stanley, a very male dominated, then going to Harvard Business School, I would say, again, fairly, you know, <clears throat> male dominated, and then sort of a, a point of pivot where um, you know, I came and joined Dusra and very much now sort of in, in the development sector. And so I do think it's worthwhile differentiating, you know, between three things, if if I may say. One is, how do you look at your inner characteristics? Um, because it's less about are you biologically a man or a woman. It's do, are you exhibiting masculine characteristics or feminine characteristics? Um, and so reflecting on that. So I spent a lot of my life shaping myself into being able to exhibit what are typically masculine characteristics. <laughs> because that was what the mainstream success was beginning to be defined for me. And so I broke through into privilege and a dominant cast per se, because I emulated, started emulating that characteristics. And frankly, I, be, I would label myself as the quota girl, right? I was a girl, a minority of color. So I grew up in Canada, did investment banking. I was like, wow, I check all the boxes. But it's only later in life that I reflected on it can get exhausting to continuously um, aspire to exhibit masculine characteristics. So think about your inner characteristics is the first thing. I think the second thing for us to think about is um, an inner critic. And this isn't so much about is it a woman or a man, it is we as women have very strong inner voices that continuously criticize, continuously define this improvement. I think to be aware of that inner dialogue, that little bird that sits in this, on your shoulder and kind of says, you're not good enough, you need to be better, whether that's feminine or masculine, I think we have an amplifying inner critic in us. And I think it, as we go along today, it'd be useful to chat about how do you manage that inner, inner critic 
um, because it's an important thing to overcome irrespective of anything, but to really move with success and towards leadership. I think the last inner, this is my three inners, the last inner is uh, inner circle. You cannot uh, downplay the power of the inner circle, right? And it kind of goes back to where I was perhaps flawed in my thinking that I must be part of that inner circle. And I recognize that as you are, recognize when you're part of that inner circle, and then it's your responsibility to grow that circle. And recognize that when you're outside the circle, a lot of folks in the inner circle won't benefit from you being there. So there's this dynamic between an inter and an outer where you need to find that intersection of those circles and begin to play back the benefits in a very objective way as to why these things you know, need to come together. And so I believe some of the responsibility of where we're going to break this is A, us addressing as women our inner critic, but B, men who are part of the inner circle, we really need to bring them into being allies, right? And I see a few men here, um, but we need more and we need women to understand how we can better engage men and create an environment and a safe space for them to engage. So again, inner characteristics, inner critic and inner circle. And now we're supposed to move, I think, to the next question. I hope you're all enjoying this new format that we've been inducted into, which is we're supposed to run this um, ourselves. So let's go to the next um, slide. Are you showing the slide? Okay, yes, yes, I see the slide. I'll read it quickly. So recent examples from some companies with leadership development only for women employees in a bid to improve their pipeline of women leader has proven to be controversial with some women saying it's discriminatory and further notion that women need that extra hand holding. So, so part of this is, I don't know, I feel a statement slightly extreme, um, but I do think there are aspects that are valuable, but it feels kind of crappy that like women need hand holding and we're this sort of victim and and therefore we shouldn't be you know set aside i think there's a careful balance here uh i actually believe there are benefits of coming together as women and, and i think a lot of my life i tried to push that away because i didn't want to be seen as oh now i'm part of you know those women that are trying to to be be different but perhaps it's old age or being a little more confident but there is you cannot underestimate coming together as women and addressing particular issues that we face because of our gender and therefore finding solutions and being inclusive of others i i think is really important let me give you an example i think there's something unspoken about the motherhood penalty if i may say um, and yes, of course, women have choices, um, fertility choices, and maybe you decide not to, but a lot of us probably don't think about it a whole lot and end up having kids, to be very frank. And there's a motherhood penalty which we don't address, whether it's in the workplace institutionally or you don't address in your family and in society. And you, we cannot underestimate all of us as Indians are plagued by patriarchy. So there's something that plays into the motherhood penalty plus this patriarchy that when you band together as a tribe to address it, not to be exclusive, I do think there is value, value in that. And, and I'm happy to chat a bit about that because I was just looking and researching the motherhood penalty something happens in our 20s and 30s right so it's about this leadership development in our 20s and 30s we suffer a pretty significant penalty maybe because that's when we're most fertile or i don't know and then what happens is that penalty and gap starts to close by our 40s and 50s so there's something in the age group between 20 30s 40s and 50s that as as a group of women and as institutions we need to be better at uh, addressing so whether it's how do you get women back in or something interesting in the motherhood penalty that after you've had a baby, it's probably better not to go back to your same place. You could be more senior in another place. So there's certain biases within this that we have to break down. Um, but I think I'm probably going over time. So I will stop here on this question and I will tag it off to my dearest Sakshi. Thank you, Neera. Um, well, while you talk about motherhood penalty, which I haven't experienced 
nor shall I, because I know I feel it's a penalty in some shape or form, and I'm going to say it out there uh, personally for me. So, but, you know, like you spoke about women coming together, we don't see that enough. Uh, we don't see that, we don't see the same concept of a sisterhood that we see of a brotherhood. And that happens in both personal and professional lives. There's something called the bro code that is equivalent uh, in both, uh, both of our professional personal journeys. Um, what hurts me the most as and I have been conditioned and I have evolved my own thinking around gender integration. Yes, men have to be allies, but what hurts me the most when women are not. Um, and that's something I'm unable to let go of uh, because I feel that you've kind of had that shared context. You've gone through your journeys of having to find it difficult to reach the point that you have. Then why aren't you as empathetic? Why aren't you kind of leaving a better uh, world for the other women out there? And we see that often. When you said, Neera, uh, the thing about uh, you know trying to emulate uh, certain characteristics and what also Megha uh, referred to, um, and eventually getting into the inner circle because you're one of those diverse people, women are the ones who kind of then close that door for other women. And because you're there, you've got the power, you're that one diverse voice in, on the table. And then it works in your favor because you'll get to move to higher, um, you reach higher uh, positions in the in the professional space. And then you close the door because then it's done. And, and, and also for people inside the room, they've checked their box because now you're kind of a little bit more diverse where you were. Um, but then when the ecosystem comes together around uh, helping all women get uplifted, et cetera. And I'm okay if you use the word handholding, uh, there, uh, men have had handholding from the very beginning. The organizations are designed for men to succeed in their culture, in their even in their office spaces when the air conditioning is at a point because you're going to come into your suits and we're going we're the one who are shivering, etc. And there are many, many more examples. The cars are designed in a way. Uh, even the dummy they use is uh, again to a, a male body type, which is actually a biological feature and not something which is a characteristic uh, for women. So there's so many of these examples. The world has been designed and to give that handholding support to men. So why be ashamed for uh, if we need that handholding support and, and whatever we're asking for is actually very, very minimal to what uh, you, they've been kind of served on a platter. Um, and we start from the sisterhood kind of thing uh, as well. And that's where I feel that uh, women need to come together. And I'm not saying don't be meritocratic, but be empathetic and don't close those doors. And actually talk about your experiences where you, you wish you would have navigated this better if I had had this and be that this for that next woman uh, where you see that they're capable. So that's where I would say that it don't, we should not be ashamed of asking for that extra thing, uh, given what everyone else uh, before us has kind of gotten as well. Uh, and that brings me to the next question that's up on the slide uh, as well. Uh, I'm just going to read it out. Research shows that female leaders experience imposter syndrome to a higher degree than their male counterparts. Uh, this can have a lasting impact on their careers, mental health, and confidence in overcoming challenges in the workplace. I am a victim of this imposter syndrome. I'm going to say it out loud because I, I also had to read up. Neera, you and I were chatting about it. Someone told me what an imposter syndrome is about. And what you said is your inner critic is kind of that uh, as well. Coming to office every day thinking, will I survive? Do, do people think I'm intelligent in, enough? I'm smart enough? Damn, I have the pedigree. I have an IM degree. I have an engineering degree. I have probably go, went into, and uh, Megan, I can have a uh, separate debate. I went to one of the better consulting firms. I'm not going to say best. I went to BCG. <laughs> I, what else? And then I hopefully, you know, with Gates, I'm also uh, ahead of the curve. Yet I come to office thinking, 
the next words coming out of my mouth are they going to be intelligent enough smart enough will i leave an impression and then you sit in a meeting room and you hear mostly from men um some stuff which has already been said probably lacks content and is not at all setting the bar for uh, uh, that intelligence that you set for yourself but they're saying it and i'm not my voice is tempered down not because of necessarily how uh, everyone sees me but for my own inner voice and my inner critic uh, that comes out and here's what i see what helped me i was worse off before i still struggle but this is where i am today because there there are people in my life who have told me now mega to what you said i see you i have mentors and that's what i feel we don't i never did enough of i also don't see other women doing enough of uh, and that's my big recommendation look for those mentors and they, you will find them in your personal family situations you will find find them in your friends in your peer set in senior leadership everywhere there are hopefully enough uh, mentors both men and women who will validate and tell you i see you i see your potential and don't let com- compliments uh, be uh, they they come so easy and we say oh uh, let me be modest about it and uh, oh, okay i got some recognition and not talk about it let me not talk about my promotion let me not talk about my salary my partner comes and tells me about his promotions and his salary and he talks in front of uh, family members so much and i'm i'm ashamed to because i think this is something wrong and that kind of leaves an impression with my family members that i earn less than him which is not the case he is a startup founder he earns nothing i am the breadwinner this is the truth and now we've reached a point where he emphasizes that where i need that male ally where i need that hand holding because they are the ones who are going to still be hurt more than me what i also say it and i'm going to say it even more because then i want to leave an impression for the next woman who's probably seeing me and saying okay this is not bad it's okay to uh, come up at uh, come up uh, be a little more confident and say you you achieved something in the world and uh, other women should see it other men should see it and hopefully we leave a uh, better something behind uh, i know that the saying a lot and neelam and i see you uh, you're in a better place right now with such a nice trees around you and i tag you and talk to me about your imposter syndrome if you've had any experience and also if you don't mind because we lost you before introduce yourself to the audience yep thanks a lot sakshi lovely hearing you guys talk i'm sorry i ran out of wifi temporarily so i've stepped out of the house because i'm so nervous i'm standing on the road where i have a phone signal so i'm planning to do the rest of the session on on my phone signal so great um yep uh well on the imposter syndrome and sort of rolling everything up i'm neelam shibar i'm the co-founder of industry foundation uh, i'm a designer by profession and uh, yeah i think our design education was a balanced education we had actually most often times more girls than guys so it is a very nurturing environment i must say uh, but i did industrial design uh, product design not because uh, i felt i had to prove myself it's just because i wanted to yeah so i think that way uh, to me w- w- what's very strongly emerging from this conversation and i also before i sign off i'd like to even show the lens of the women we work with because we do a lot of gender empowerment work frankly right and uh, i will talk about imposter syndrome from my side and i'll also talk about it from women who are very very who need desperate hand holding frankly because like someone pointed out we are a very patriarchal extremely feudal society right we guys are blessed all of us urban well educated we are deeply blessed we have our issues and i think it's super critical that we surge ahead like neera said i've never been a gender person uh, i am now recognizing some of it and coming back to also the example of where is this natural how is this going to be a natural fit for society i want to cover that too all in my two and a half minutes so i will try to be very fast about all of this but coming back to the main topic 
which is imposter syndrome well i think i just bludgeoned myself into not feeling any imposter syndrome frankly which has had a very negative impact let me tell you yeah i speak very loudly someone just said <laughs> someone speaks louder than you well i speak so loudly my husband is like constantly saying go down go down so these are all the reactions that we have so i am an entrepreneur i am a leader of a pretty large organization but over the years i have tried to analyze why as a child i was not heard enough because i was a girl right i had a I had a brother so maybe i just had to speak louder to my mom to get her to understand what i wanted so i just have luckily or miraculously the personality which makes everybody else around me suffer but <laughs> i have never i think allowed myself maybe that's why i've gotten to where i have right uh on the imposter syndrome i have felt something a lot when i have gone globally within india because i run my own enterprise so no one can say anything to me so i do not feel that way in my own a uh, work that i do but when i have traveled globally when i have gone fundraising globally i have really felt uh, the huge white male bias and here again i have felt uh, a your asian b you've got white hair right there is also a very big thing around age for women there is this great golden ceiling somewhere around age i think uh, and the fact that i refuse to dye my hair i mean i'm sure i would raise far more money if i dyed my hair but i refuse to do it right so to me my personal i am not plagued by too many feelings of being an imposter i and i believe i'm hiding it to be very frank i believe it's sort of hidden and i have to go in and analyze it uh, but i haven't done that as yet and therefore i really appreciate all the others on the on the on the panel today who have actually gone in and have recognized it right and uh, because they are working in very large organizations and they have emerged from very competitive mba schools and things like that where i can imagine i can well not imagine it must have been incredibly tough right now um on the where is a woman and where is the more feminine force a natural feminine force uh, which even males have right and I, i really appreciated what neera pointed out it's about the yin and the yang it's about the male and female forces right uh, uh, energies which actually create a balance in society in the world right i love uh, industry launched uh, we didn't launch it happened a collaborative called creative dignity i have seen that women have a natural tendency to collaborate very 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 natural tendency to collaborate and i've gone in and analyzed it and i've analyzed it to the fact that maybe it's all like pop psychology obviously that the male over the years had to fight off the animals and all his testosterone i don't know i'm using all the wrong pronunciations but whatever it is so they are kind of primed maybe more of the alpha males not today's modern day cooperative males there are very very collaborative males around now right but around being individuals and around striving ahead alone right then there's another piece of pop psychology i see, i see the slide just give me a, a last second i picked up that men work in packs women work alone actually but they don't work in packs they work alone but they work collaboratively so this is a huge asset which as the world mo moves into a far more collaborative framework you're going to see that female forces are going to really rise and take over the world i i strongly believe that coming down to the message that's popped up which i'm going to read without my specs so pardon me gender equality is about much more than just seats at the table research shows that the gender parity gaps will be closed only with the understanding and support of both men and women however 
many men do not know how to be true allies to the women in their lives, colleagues, partners, family, friends, and acquaintances. Right, so uh, I completely, completely agree with Sakshi. I really believe uh, that women should actively look for allies. We should actively look at being promoted. And uh, males are the best allies. So we work a lot with IKEA. And obviously, uh, the other point also very well taken on why are women not more natural allies, right? And to that, I think the fact was that women actually work alone. They don't work in packs, right? But women work collaboratively together. So I believe that if organizations are more collaboratively structured, like we, for example, are looking at our next line in industry foundation, and we've made it very clear. It's not, we are never going to have a CEO. We are going to have a collaborative of leaders. So we will have eight to 10 senior leaders who will work as a collaborative. Five will be women, five will be men, right? So I believe that the structures for even men to become allies, as so many of my co-panelists have already pointed out, organizational structures need to dramatically change, right? So when I am refusing to have a CEO, why? Because then the CEO is top boss, there's too much power with one CEO. I mean, you work on flatter organizations, work on organizations that are naturally more feminine. Why not, right? So I think organizational structuring is going to go through dramatic changes in the next 10 to 15 years. And that is when the ecosystem will make it easier for men and women to become more natural allies in the journey to more gender balance. Industry Foundation is struggling. There are some uh, parts of our organization where we have more women than men. All the women we work with at grassroots level are women. We, have, we build women's collectives. It's impossible to collectivize men. We have never built a male collective, right? So they're all women. So, but when it comes to having the professional managers handhold the women, it's very tough for us at village level to get male, I mean, female professional service providers. So we are coaching all the men at rural level to become allies to the women and pull women up through the ranks to make them leaders in the collectives and professional service providers. So it's, it's something that has to be very actively worked on. We work with IKEA. IKEA has a huge, they have 50% women, yeah? But they have a huge mandate that their board needs to be 50%. And they're not doing it artificially. They are handholding women within the organization to rise up to board level. Yeah? And, they, and, it, and, and they're gonna make it happen. So I think that there has to be very active programs to help men become allies and even maybe women become allies. And I'll pass it on now to Megha. Yeah. Thank you. Ilan, those are two such phenomenal examples. One is of you know how you guys are really changing structures, right? Because um, the structures have to be redesigned. And then I love the idea of IKEA because I feel like, you know, I'm very afraid of the 33% number. Uh, I feel like, you know, 33% or 28 to 33% are generally considered good goals. And I, uh, you know, a part of me, um, you know, the stubborn part of me just uh, hates that number. I find it too low. I find it just too low a number to, to aspire to when I see 30, you know, we've got 30% in our leadership team. I, I, it, it's a good place to start, but I don't think it's a good goal to have. I think the goals need to be a lot more ambitious. In terms of allies, you know, I'll talk a little bit about my own experiences and, and Sakshi, you referred to this. Uh, I think male and female allies are both key. I think, I, I think going it alone is, is stressful. It's difficult. Uh, it's not fun, to be honest, right? Because we tend to solve so much ourselves, whereas I've seen the real masters of the craft actually spread it across. They get more ideas in. They're able to just you know, diffuse the stress across more people. It's just in all ways looks better, right? Um, you know, female allies are, uh, I'll talk a little bit about female allies uh, too, um, but I've, I've seen the change. I've seen a lot of change. And, uh, you know, Sakshi, what, what you brought up is 
has been true, has been observed in past, but I also see it changing so much. I see, you know, uh, folks and including myself right now, um, daring to wear their gender on their sleeve, right? Which is amazing. It's in the workplace. It's all, you know, male traits being like, you know, being, being aggressive has been, has, and, and I'm talking about, I may not have the language, right? Whether it's male or masculine, but it's always been a positive. I feel like I see more and more women as well as men, um, still not the majority, but increasingly more people wear it on their sleeve, right? And talk about it. Um, so hopefully we'll see a change there. In terms of male allies, you know, I really struggle with this one. I think they're absolutely essential. The first one is I think it begins at home. Um, to me it, and, and my husband, as, as Sakshi called out, is a, is a very direct target for all of this, right? It's like all my intensive gender coaching is practiced and all the results are first observed uh, on my husband. And he's, you know, he's played ball and uh, because mostly because he had no choice to, but hopefully also because he wants to do the right thing. But I do think it really begins at home, not because of his allyship to me, but I have seen him change as a professional with the women and men he works with. And I think that is key. And he has brought that up to me. He has started to see things. He started to observe things in his teams, which... I have not seen, and maybe it's because he brings them up to me because he's my husband, but I like to believe that it's more than just that, right? He's, he's, he's developed, uh, you know, an eye for things which, which he would not have earlier. Um, so I do believe allyship begins at home. It is very difficult, not impossible, right? But it's very difficult to be a great ally if you don't practice it at home. I, 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 I fail to see how that would happen because, because it shows through. I think the other part of being a good ally, of being a powerful male ally, and this is to the men, I know that there aren't very many but hope on, on this call, but hopefully the women can also talk to the men. I think a very important part of being a male ally is to really understand that you do not know. I'm not saying that as a negative, right? It is eye-opening to start seeing things from another person's perspective. For me, uh, you know, a mini breakthrough happened when when I when I had to take on the leadership of what we call women at Bain, and you know, we used to do a lot of good things. But but I said, let me start by actually talking to the bearing it all to the leadership team. Uh, it was amazing, and it was encouraging the number of men who came up to me and said, "We didn't know," and I'm like, "And you're going to have to try harder to understand. Don't leave it. I I I gave you a break." You know, I shared it with you, but in order for you to be a good ally, you're going to have to first know that you don't know, and you're going to have to make the effort to understand. And that effort won't come with, hey, you're a woman, tell me your challenges. No, it is going to be by understanding patterns, taking out patterns, what is different, really developing an eye for it, which is helped when you see it at home. But if it's not done at home, you'll have to make the extra effort. But I can tell you, it goes a long way. We seek out men in our teams, men amongst our clients, women in our team who work better, who create an environment where one thrives and is not, and the environment isn't skewed, right? And it's not skewed in terms of factors which we believe are harder to control. So to me, you know, it is male allyship is critical. I'll call out one more part of male allyship, which again, Sakshi, I think you alluded to it, but I'm going to reinforce it again. I I do want male allies, especially those who've seen the benefits also in terms of economic uh, economics to please call it out. Every time my, you know, my husband, and I'm going to share a personal example. Every time my husband is very often, he's seen as poor chap. He has to do so much at home. And I'm like, no, he is so lucky. <laughs> he's so lucky because he only has to bring in half the income at home. He's so lucky because he has the option of saying, maybe I should take a break. Um, so I, I, I really believe women and men who are in that position, right? And again, I'm not judging that position because there are many contextual factors. But if you found yourself to be fortunate enough in that position, please talk about not just the societal health and education outcomes, but please talk about the financial outcomes as well. At every level, those matter. And those can be a big game changer here as well. So... Uh, I don't know if I'm to tag anybody here, but, uh, but oh, this is, the, so I have another topic to cover and I'm going to, you know, do a, what I call a shameless plug, which is, uh, I'm the source of this, of this statement. Uh, so we did some recent research uh, at, at Bain where amongst women entrepreneurs, we looked at the impact of COVID-19 
And uh, this is not just true of entrepreneurs, but what we did so see, and I don't think this is any surprise that there has been disproportionate impact on women. Uh, when we look at the larger numbers, there has been increased unemployment, at-home responsibilities, as well as uh, social injustices, such as increase in domestic violence. Now, I'm going to share my own thoughts on this because this is an excerpt from what we wrote, but I do want to call out that all of this has been backed by research not done by us, by other folks. So I, so it's very, and intuitively, we know this resonates. But I do want to call out that I personally, and through our interviews with about over 300 entrepreneurs, believe that it's not all doom and gloom. It has been, an, you know, it has been an undeniably hard time. But I do believe there are two big changes that have happened, which maybe my glass half full self wants to amplify. One is that for the first time, we're all working remotely like it's the most normal thing to do. For years and decades, you know, we've been talking about flexibility and remote work from the vantage point of women. You know, it's finally happened, right? And it wasn't that hard. It happened fast. It didn't need gradual change. Every time we talk about evolutionary change, it pains me because I don't believe it has to be evolutionary. COVID-19 did something which otherwise would have taken decades. And guess who it benefits more? It benefits women more. Of course, a lot of structural factors have to come in place. Secondly, as unfortunate as it is, the economic environment is such that there is greater openness for an all hands on deck approach. So I do believe this is an opportunity for women's role to be seen, um, not just as some self-actualization good, but also as, as actually driving true benefits for the family. Not easy, none of this is easy. I'm sitting in a very privileged position and I'd like to call that out. But I do believe this is, this is the time wherever we have the opportunity to recognize that opportunity to renegotiate roles at home so that we can actually capitalize on it rather than uh, only get, uh, and to the extent that we can control, only get pulled down, right? And that renegotiation is hard, but, but if not now, it isn't going to happen. And that renegotiation may mean that I'm not going to be the one accompanying my child's Zoom class every day. I need help over here and it's not just help, I need you, I need others to do their bit as well. So I personally believe uh, and have, uh, you know, have actually had the opportunity to speak with a number of urban entrepreneurs to, to clarify. I believe there is opportunity here as well. It's not all doom and gloom. And, and you know, frankly, women are, are very resilient. Um, you know, they do resist the doom and gloom a lot more than, more than, uh, more than other folks. So, um, I, you know, I'd love to open it up to the group. Neera, Neelam, Sakshi, your thoughts uh, on you know, uh, how you've seen the impact, you all, you know, work with different populations, and I would love to hear that perspective as uh, other perspectives on this as well. I was just I'm thinking, happy to share. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah Neelam, uh, can you share? And then what I thought, because I know we only have 10 minutes left, is that you share, and I might add in a few questions that I think you could give some good good perspective to, and then I can share back a few no, no, questions. You you uh, uh, yeah? Nira, we have very little time. You carry on. We should. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, time. no. So you you respond, but also add in. There have been some questions on which you can speak to Neelam quite well, which is why is there a rural communities easily accepting of women? So we speak about how great that they come into the self help groups. Is there some kind of dynamic that happens in rural communities? That, that is different than other communities was a question that came up on the chat group. If you could just chat a bit about that as you respond to, to Mega, yeah. as yeah. well as this challenge of being a female founder. So there's a lot of questions around being a female founder and, and frankly, investors love men. So how do you kind of find, find that balance? And, and I can admit something to this group later, but you go, go ahead to incorporate that. Yeah, yeah. No, so I'll just quickly uh, touch upon uh, a feedback at, of COVID, again, with my experience on creative dignity, which is an urban movement, right? So initially, in the peak of COVID, it was launched, people came in, volunteered, 250 active volunteers, quite a few women, but substantial men. Now that COVID is tapering off, I'm noticing the pressure on the men to get back to work, get back to work. It's not that there is no pressure on the women too, right? But I really believe that the societal pressure on the male, whether it's psychological, 
they are also a deeply pressured lot, right? So I really believe that if males realize exactly to the point made by my, uh, uh, that they are really fortunate when they will look for more balance, then the societal pressure on, on just them to perform will come down a lot. So now we are left with 99% women in creative dignity right now. And I feel really sad about that because we need far more balance. Num number two, about rural and the, to that question, well, rural women are coming together in SAGs because the government has pumped in billions and billions of dollars. Someone has handheld that entire movement. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, yeah. yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so it's, it's exactly that, right? So what did Mohammed um, Yunus discover? He discovered that microfinance could be started because when five women came together in a group, they ag agreed to take a group collateral. So they came together and 99.9% .9 return was happening on those loans because those women mutually trusted and stood by each other, right? So that is the backbone of microfinance. And that again then played forward in India's SCG movement, which was strongly supported by huge government budgets. And that's the reason also the fact that uh, a lot of money went into training, but it was a natural fit with the psychology of the women. Women are far more collaborative because over centuries, that's how they had to be, right? Uh, so that's on the rural SAG answer. And on being a co-founder, I mean, on being a founder, co-founder, I agree. I completely agree. It's tough being a female founder. I keep telling both my sons, hello, come in. You're young, you're uh, men, and you are, you are from a US university, neither of which I was when I started fundraising. And I said, you will raise bucket loads of cash, right? So there is an issue here. We know it. Uh, and I don't have an answer for this, except for the fact that uh, I, I believe the future is going to be in far more female organization driven models, which I think investors will start seeing uh, so, uh, solutions in. Right now, I'm a great prop a proponent for uh, collaborative growth models. They need far less investment. So, and they, they grow far faster. The kind of work Creative Dignity did in six months as a collaborative, I would have had to, I, I would have spent one and a half years raising a million dollars to do it, right? So these are the kinds of case studies that need to be put out there. Great. That's it, I'll stop here, yeah. yeah. Yeah, thank, thanks, Neelam. Sakshi, I'm just going to ask you to take a bundle of these these questions. Um, earlier, we had heard from a few folks, like, how do you stand up for, recognize, you know, tackle some of the boardroom dynamic, the meeting dynamic was one question. And how do you start to build uh, a more positive narrative uh, around being sort of men versus women and, and that it doesn't sort of spiral into something uh, combative. Maybe you can take that with a few few strategies. Thanks, Neera. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, this in terms of my personal experience. Um, I think for me, what helped really, uh, sorry, I'm just getting some random notification. Uh, what helped, so I've not been in many boardroom conversations, let me say it, but I've been in enough conversations which have senior leadership around where these dynamics play. Um, a couple of things that I've tried out and helps me and people who are speaking up at that point of time. Uh, if there's a woman who's made a valid point, again, merit takes precedence over everything. So if you've got content right, they've made a point and I can see that there's a dynamic playing in the room where her voice is being drowned. I'm going to just say the same thing. And like you said, Mega, I'm going to re-emphasize this point that I'm going to give you that credit. I'm going to make that point again. And without really offending other people around uh, and say that, oh, okay, you let her voice drown out, etc. I'm just going to keep validating, saying those things, reinforcing those things, which I think are right and relevant. And hopefully that gives uh, my, uh, my fellow colleague 
more confidence to speak up and continue to make that point so that's something that is not uh, offensive and hopefully it makes the point uh, across second personally when you're speaking up you know just like just do it and i'm hoping there's enough backing you will find around to make your point even if you feel that imposter syndrome coming in uh, we unless we make that switch in our own minds it's not going to happen uh, nobody is going to serve a lot of stuff on uh, on platter to us uh, no matter how many systems and structures uh, we put in place so those are couple of things that um, that i do personally and i feel that uh, i'm getting better uh, over time to do, to look at the boardroom dynamics uh, in terms of you know not making a men versus women i it's a it's a th- fine balance right so i i hopefully don't i don't want to come across as this being a competition around men versus women in fact i feel both are needed if you're calling diversity diversity means everyone uh, and inclusivity means everyone together um what helps in these situations for me i'm just going to use examples where i've seen men as allies what again what megha said about her husband how he's kind of been the guinea pig i have the same situation at home so i'm going to use things around saying oh you know my husband cooked a great meal he loves to cook i'm going to break that myth stereotype that i i am the person who's the chef in the uh, in the house i'm not uh, but it's a nice way for me to say to my uh, aunts and uncles who've had those stereotypes forever to say that he's going to cook he's going to make the chai he's going to come and serve when people are home and it's totally okay without really kind of and i use the same analogy uh, bang on megha unless things start at home nothing will happen at the professional front as well but i use the same analogy when i'm in meetings uh, as well it's absolutely okay for me to delegate to a junior man and say that this is what you have to do and maybe you do the coffee rounds why not so uh i'm never going to go and point at least intentionally ever say i choose a woman versus a man uh, there i don't know if that helps yes yes that that does thank you we we have sort of one minute left so i'm just going to wrap up with a couple of comments on on some questions around middle class participation of women and and just to highlight that we're a interesting country when you look at other countries the more educated women are the more they participate in the workforce something plays into our country where the more educated we are the more we opt out or we think actually being in the workplace our family see that as compromising status so there's something here that we have to be able to overcome even in our most privileged families to to break these barriers and come into the into the workplace because that's really where we're going to get you know the biggest bang for for our buck. I'm going to give Mega I saw you unmute. You have 30 seconds cuz we're at 12:30 if you want to add anything to this and then we'll no, wrap. No, I mean I I I I didn't realize I unmuted but I but I couldn't agree more and I think we have to glorify to the extent that uh we can influence some populations we just have to glorify the benefits um of you know of being in the workforce and frankly to the to the extent that we have the privilege completely undermine uh you know defy any conventions around status uh as as much as we can hopefully that serves as inspiration to folks uh and uh, and yeah i think it's a i i think it can happen pretty fast with a with a young generation coming in um but i do think we have to we, we, each of us has to play our part and you know uh, at an individual level as well But thank so you. thank you. Yeah, thank you panel on behalf of everyone. I am volunteering the four of us if we can be helpful to any of you in any way. Um we're offering ourselves um please feel free to to reach out to us. Thank you for attending. Take-